Welcome to the Rescue Pod training video. In this presentation, we'll look at how CPR circulates blood when the heart stops, how the Rescue Pod, an impedance threshold device, or ITD, works to enhance circulation during the performance of CPR, how to use the Rescue Pod during the performance of both basic and advanced cardiac life support, and finally, how three errors common during the performance of CPR can undermine your ability to effectively circulate blood. The Rescue Pod has patented technology that has been shown in animal and clinical studies during cardiac arrest to double the amount of blood that returns to the heart, increase blood flow to the brain by 50%, double systolic blood pressure, provide a benefit in all rhythms, increase the likelihood of successful defibrillation, and increase survival rates. Let's begin by looking at how conventional manual CPR circulates blood. We'll use the rescue man demonstrator shown here. The blue balloons represent the lungs and the red balloon represents the heart. During CPR, compressing the chest causes blood to circulate forward both by mechanically squeezing the heart between the sternum and the spine and also by creating a positive pressure that forces air out of the lungs and blood out of the heart. This is called cardiac output. When the chest wall is allowed to recoil or relax, the exact opposite occurs. A slight negative pressure or vacuum draws some air back into the lungs and some blood back into the heart. In this graph of airway pressures in the chest, the tall wave represents positive pressure ventilation. The smaller waveforms are chest compressions. Positive pressure empties the heart, creating cardiac output, and negative pressure refills the heart, creating preload. These alternating positive and negative pressures work to circulate blood. However, even when performed correctly, CPR results in only about 10 to 20 percent of normal blood flow to the heart and 20 to 30 percent of normal blood flow to the brain. One of the reasons CPR is inherently inefficient is that as the chest wall recoils, Air rushes in through an open airway and wipes out the vacuum that we're relying on to refill the heart. Thus, the heart stops filling with blood as soon as the pressure inside and outside the chest equalizes. Finding a way to enhance the intrathoracic vacuum would increase preload and lead to increased cardiac output on the subsequent compression. The inefficiency of CPR can be corrected by adding the rescue pod to the ventilation circuit, either on a face mask or an advanced airway. With the rescue pod in place, when you compress the chest, it allows air to leave, but when the chest wall recoils, it prevents ambient air from being sucked back into the chest. Essentially, the valving mechanism inside opens during the compression phase and closes during the recoil phase. Preventing outside air from rushing in enhances the vacuum and results in more blood being returned to the heart or improved preload. Let's look at how the airway pressure tracings change when the rescue pod is added to the circuit. You can see now that ventilations look the same, but there's an enhanced negative pressure or vacuum with each recoil of the chest wall that pulls more blood back to the heart. Studies have shown that the rescue pod also lowers the pressure inside the head during the recoil phase of CPR. The combined effect of increasing cardiac output and lowering intracranial pressure has the net effect of significantly improving overall blood flow to the brain. It's therefore important to get the rescue pod into the circuit as soon as possible after chest compressions are begun so that it can begin providing its therapeutic benefits. 
Now let's look at how the rescue pod selectively regulates airflow into and out of the chest. When a chest compression is performed, the patient can freely exhale. When it's time to provide a breath, the patient can be freely ventilated. It's only during the chest wall recoil phase that unnecessary air is prevented from entering the patient. In summary, here are chest compressions during conventional CPR without the rescue pod. And here you can see the effect when the rescue pod is applied. Even though the rescue pod is placed in the ventilation circuit, it's actually a chest compression device because it provides its benefit during the chest wall recoil phase of CPR. The rescue pod should be applied as soon as you determine that chest compressions are needed. The earlier you get it into the circuit, the sooner it can begin enhancing circulation. When using the rescue pod on a face mask, it's critical to obtain and maintain a tight face mask seal in order to develop the vacuum during chest wall recoil. The best way to do this is to have the rescuer at the airway use a two-handed face mask technique. This rescuer's only job is to maintain the seal during chest compressions and ventilations. When it's time to give a breath, if a third rescuer is not available to ventilate, the chest compressor should reach over and deliver the breath so that the rescuer at the airway does not have to take their hands off the face mask. Make sure to perform CPR at the recommended compression to ventilation ratio and to ventilate over one second. Once an advanced airway is placed, confirmed, and secured, move the rescue pod to the airway. Turn on the timing assist lights. Ventilate over one second when the light flashes and perform asynchronous chest compressions at the recommended compression rate. If end tidal CO2 monitoring is desired, be sure to place the detector between the rescue pod and the ventilation source. If the rescue pod fills with fluid, clear it by disconnecting it from the airway and blowing it out using the ventilation bag. Because the rescue pod restricts the inflow of air when a vacuum is created at the patient port side, if a patient begins to breathe and the rescue pod is not removed, the valving mechanism will make it more difficult for the patient to take a breath. For this reason, it's important to remove the rescue pod once a pulse is restored and chest compressions are no longer being provided. Now that you've seen how the rescue pod works during CPR, let's discuss three common errors that can undermine the efficacy of CPR with or without the rescue pod in place. The first error is hyperventilation. Every time you ventilate a patient, you create a positive pressure in the chest that wipes out any vacuum that is formed. Each positive pressure ventilation also causes a decrease in the size of the chambers of the heart, and their ability to fill with blood is reduced. Let's demonstrate. Notice that when a positive pressure ventilation is delivered, it squeezes the heart and makes it difficult for blood to return. Ventilating too often lowers the blood pressure during CPR. You still need to ventilate patients, but it should be done at the recommended compression to ventilation ratio and over one second duration. The rescue pod has timing assist lights that flash at 10 times a minute to help promote the proper ventilation rate. The lights can also be used to guide compressions. For a compression rate of 100 per minute, the compressor should provide 10 chest compressions per light flash. The second error occurs when the rescuers begin to fatigue. As they tire, they rest on the chest and do not allow it to recoil completely. Remember that it's during the chest wall recoil phase that the heart fills with blood. 
If the chest is not allowed to re-expand completely, the amount of blood that returns to the heart is decreased. This reduced filling results in less cardiac output on the next compression. Notice how allowing the chest to fully expand improves preload. When performing chest compressions, make sure to allow the chest wall to recoil completely. The third error occurs when a tight seal is not maintained while using the rescue pod on a face mask. A tight face mask seal is necessary to generate the vacuum that increases circulation. This can be demonstrated by putting a small hole in the bottom of the rescue pod, which will simulate the leak that occurs when you don't maintain a tight face mask seal. First, let's remind ourselves what heart refilling looks like with a tight seal and complete chest wall recoil. In this situation, preload is optimized. Now, let's simulate a poor face mask seal. Notice that the vacuum that forms is much less because the rescue pod's effect is reduced. This is why maintaining a tight seal during chest compressions with a face mask is critical. Remember to use a two-handed technique to maintain the seal whenever you are using the rescue pod with a face mask. Okay, let's summarize. The generation of alternating positive and negative pressures causes the emptying and refilling of the heart during CPR. When the rescue pod is added to the circuit, unnecessary air is prevented from rushing in and the vacuum in the chest is optimized, resulting in a doubling of preload, which causes improved cardiac output on the next compression. Finally, Remember to perform high-quality CPR at all times in order to optimize the rescue pod's effectiveness. Begin chest compressions as soon as pulselessness is confirmed. Apply the rescue pod to the circuit as soon as possible. Provide ventilations over one second and at the recommended compression to ventilation ratio. Use a two-handed technique to maintain a tight face mask seal during both compressions and ventilations. Perform chest compressions at the recommended rate and depth. Assure that the chest wall is allowed to recoil completely. Rotate chest compression duties frequently. Avoid unnecessary interruptions in CPR. And Remove the rescue pod if a pulse returns and chest compressions are no longer required. Thank you for taking the time to learn about the rescue pod. Please contact us with any questions and check out our website for more product information and training resources.